listeners and viewers what a mighty time we have that we can be able to share this also that the Lord can be able to release such important revelation about his own word surely it's a big blessing to share with you this and it is a big blessing to be part of this revelation that is coming from the Lord even to the church now today I want to talk about a very very important event the event that I'm talking about relates to serving the Lord with rejection again I'm going to talk about the bitter rejection that characterizes the service that we give unto the Lord and I'm going to be able to tie it for you very very closely so you can be able to see the mirror image of Christ when he walked through he walked around he walked throughout this earth and we all know that he faced a bitter rejection not only from the church the Pharisees and the Sadducees but even from his own his own people rejected him and then we see very clearly that at the end even as Christ is exiting he is now exit is in the exit coming out of the sin he made a statement that tells you that it was war that he had gone through and he had won that war and the statement he made said this is what the statement said he said I have overcome the world which means he has fought and finally managed to overcome the world so that in a nutshell explains the level of rejection the level of warfare that he had gone through even to overcome that is not I have enjoyed the world overcome which means there was resistance there was isolation there was all to do with rejection in his stay here on earth even before he was raptured after resurrection now I'm looking at a very important event and today our lead scripture is going to focus on the book of John chapter 4 verses 1 all the way to 21 and the title of this message is the church at the well of Jacob in other words if you want you can call it the church at Jacob's well and I'm going to walk you very very carefully into a very deep revelation the Lord has entrusted me with even how that church at the well of Jacob essentially speaks about the church the today's church the church we are in right now and how that is tied to the preparations towards the rapture and what is it about it that the church can learn and review herself and be restored by the Holy Spirit what is the Holy Spirit saying to the church in this conversation now in the book of John chapter 4 I'm reading verses 1 on he says the title is Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman and he says verse 1 the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining do you hear that somebody he was gaining benefiting the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John now remember John the Baptist came preaching repentance for the remission of sins and he baptized them in the Jordan River and so in John chapter 4 even as we begin you right away see the, the source of conflict when they say he says the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John that to them was a big concern although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples so in other words when the Lord was doing his ministry the Pharisees were looking at him with a critical eye and they were paying a lot of attention to the advancement of his ministry 
and they saw that he was gaining ground, gaining and baptizing more people. And you see very clearly that it, it, essentially it's the disciples that were given authority by the Lord to baptize. So a lot of people were being converted. They were believing in Christ, believing in the Lord Jesus. They were becoming believers, Christians, and the Lord was gaining. So to the Pharisees, this was a main, main concern. And so you see very clearly, that's why they, they say, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was his disciples that baptized, you see. Verse 3, he says, When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back at once to Galilee. So, he wanted to move back to the Galilee because of the critique that was happening there. They were becoming uncomfortable, the Pharisees, that he was baptizing more people. And this is pivotal. This is the head of this scripture today and this message. And you see that the head of the message already is beginning with the conflict, the potential conflict. They were not happy that Jesus is gaining. And you see that the gaining and baptizing of more, even more than John did, is already hinting to you where the Lord wants to take the church in this process. He's talking about revival. Already you can see the making of a revival. You can see the hint of a revival here. And they are very concerned. Why would the Pharisees be bothered that Jesus is gaining and baptizing more people than even John did? Now I want to share with you deeper insights about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'll bring them together in one cluster so I can talk about them, so you can understand as a foundation to this message why there was concern from the Pharisees, the resistance. The first line of resistance was from Pharisees on the fact that Jesus was gaining. A resistance that causes Jesus to move from Judea and at once go towards the Galil, the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, the way they call it in Israel. Look at this somebody. The Pharisees were always known as very critical people. They were very, very critical people. They were people that always criticized. And they, they were hypocrites also. They, they were hypocritical. They were people that said one thing and did another thing. Hmm? They were people that did not believe in the Lord when he came. In fact, they acted as a stumbling block to the Lord. I'm talking about the Pharisees. And we see very clearly that the Pharisees had a lot of interest at that time. They expressed a lot of interest in the practice of baptism. Because they knew that baptism is very critical in the process of converting converts, believers. Again, let me repeat this. Why would Pharisees be more concerned specifically about baptism. Listen to this somebody. The Pharisees were very much aware that in the process, in the mechanics, in the chronology of converting somebody to become a believer in Christ Jesus, baptism was very pivotal. That begins to tell you that this warfare that the Lord was fighting was not even a physical warfare. It was much more spiritual than physical. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees essentially become the physical embodiment of the spirits that were fighting. The enemy, the devil. Hallelujah. To me that is a very big revelation to the church because you see very clearly that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are supposed to have belonged to the house of the Lord. And yet the first line of resistance the Lord meets is coming from the house of the Lord. To take you back, even in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40, 41, 42, 43, even 44, when the Lord was speaking about the temple in Jerusalem, even in the book of Mark, you see very clearly that when the Lord was coming into Jerusalem, the first line of resistance was 
in the house of the Lord. So this is common. This was common, common practice. And the Lord Jesus was already aware that resistance was not going to come from out, but was going to come from the house of the Lord. What you would call the church today. That makes you begin to understand that it's a spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. And so, to take you to another level, you also see that at that time, it is the house of the Lord that failed to recognize the Lord Jesus. The people that were outside the house of the Lord, the ordinary people, for them they believed, they were converted, they were the ones being baptized. They were available to the gospel. You see that? While the Pharisees and Sadducees were not available. And that's why you see that when the Lord entered in, in, in that scripture where the Lord enters on a donkey and he enters into Jerusalem, he goes around the temple and they were inside the temple praying. What kind of prayer were they giving to the Lord? To the Lord God in heaven. Most obviously, they were praying, asking the Lord our God in heaven, that please send us the Messiah. Please send us the Christ. Definitely, that's what they were praying for. Because at that time, they knew that the Christ would come and restore the kingdom of Israel. You see that? And Christ would stop the enemy, block the enemy from attacking them and inflicting a lot of casualty on their side. So the prayer was, please send us the Messiah. Please send us the Christ. But now the Christ comes on a donkey and he goes around the temple of the Lord outside. Inside they are praying for the Christ, but the Christ is already here. The only point being that they have failed to recognize him. And they became interested in the baptism Jesus was doing in the book of John chapter 4, which is our lead scripture today. Why? Because in the spiritual realm, you can right away understand that baptism is very central, very critical in the process that converts somebody into a believer. You see that? So it's amazing that even the disciples, you see that? The disciples were being used here to baptize people. So Jesus was speaking about the big sweeping revival that will come to the church. I'm just laying a foundation so you understand where we are heading to. And today what I'm talking about is serving the Lord in the midst of bitter rejection. And we are seeing a mirror image of what Christ goes through. So we may be able to endure and to serve him with the quality he deserves. The Pharisees, if I were to take you forward, when John the Baptist came and John started baptizing people, they resisted John. They were very concerned about the baptism John was giving. In the same context, that's why they were concerned that Jesus was gaining more by baptizing people. Let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 3 so you can see. It's warfare. It is spiritual warfare because the same Pharisees are very hypocritical. They are very critical of the Lord. They are legalistic people. People that believed in keeping the law of Moses. You see that? They were people that were very bureaucratic. By the way, there were people that were even theologians. They were learned. They read a lot about the theology. They did not believe in the Spirit of the Lord. There were people that essentially fought the gospel. They believed in the law of Moses. And they read far and wide about the law of Moses, even to, the, to greater depth about the law of Moses. They did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in the Christ. You see that? And so this is amazing to me that the, immediately Jesus was gaining, you know, baptizing, they begin to resist him, causing him to leave. And this is the journey that I'm going to talk about, the journey that brings up the resistance. And you see that in this journey, there is a church that is at the well of Jacob. 
at Jacob's Well. But before we start the journey, I'm just building a foundation for you so you may understand what caused Jesus to leave Judea and at once go towards the Galil. Hallelujah. And the book of Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 they were also very concerned about the baptism John was doing. John the Baptist. In that way you may understand the genesis of the resistance they launched on the Lord Jesus. Matthew 3 7 he says this. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees hallelujah coming to where he was he was baptizing he said to them you broods of vipers who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not think you can say to yourselves we have Abraham as our father I tell you out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham but this is very critical. Why did I bring this in? Because you see the line of resistance that Jesus is encountering firsthand is the same line of resistance that has a genesis, has a beginning from when John was baptizing and they resisted him. Up to a point that when they, when they saw him baptizing more and more, they finally appeared and said, you broods of vipers, look at how John encounters them even calls them broods of vipers and he says you know you broods of vipers who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath the coming judgment of the Lord hallelujah that's absolutely clear now that surely the resistance the Lord Jesus met from the Pharisees because he was gaining and baptizing was absolutely immense enormous which resistance causes him to leave the Judea towards the Galilee. And that is the centerpiece in this message today. That journey. This is just a foundation. The journey that he takes when he's going from Judea all the way to the Galilee. That is critical for us. The Pharisees were also conservative people. They believed in separating themselves. They kept traditions. They believed in traditions. And that's tricky because they mixed the theology even the laws of Moses with tradition and we know very well that the more Israel came into the promised land and found the other communities at times they even defiled themselves and intermarried so surely they incorporated some of the defiled traditions of the other communities into their traditions they did not stick to only the tradition of the law of Moses but yet, the Pharisees and the Sadducees still respected the traditions and of the elders, you see? Even if it had incorporated in some of the defilements of the Amalekites, the Amorites, all the other people they met there, you see that? The people they intermarried with. So that tells you right away from the word go that the resistance that was coming from the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the baptism that Jesus was launching the process of converting, the process of beginning to shape up a revival came from the devil because the, only the devil knows the spiritual significance of baptism, the depth of it, the fact that when you are baptized you are actually symbolizing the death with Christ and the resurrection with him. They were more political, they were orthodox, they were more theologians, they denied the resurrection and many things critical they launched warfare against the Lord and many many others the book of John chapter 1 verse 24 for example also talks about this situation that the Pharisees were, 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 were lodging and launching on the Lord John chapter 1 verse 24 they were very much aware of the Lord Jesus and what he had brought look at what he says here 124 he says now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet why would this be important in this conversation because the Pharisees knew that when the Christ would come one of the main features of Christ is that the Christ would baptize in other words would convert people 
there was going to be a, a, a significant change in the lives of the people. And yet the Pharisees and the Sadducees, being stuck in their traditions, did not yet believe that the Christ had arrived. No wonder John the Baptist told them that standing among you is one who is greater than I, whose sandals I'm not even able or I'm not qualified, the buckles of his sandals I'm not qualified to untie or to tie. Hallelujah. John told them, standing among you, which means you have not recognized him, but he's standing among you. And that's why you see, when John was asked whether he was the Christ or the prophet Elijah, he said, no, I am not the Christ. He was very clear on that. But that caused a lot of fight and resistance because they said, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? And yet, when Christ Jesus appeared, they failed to recognize him, but they see that he is baptizing. They said, just a moment, why is he baptizing? Because only the Christ should come and baptize. They knew what Christ would do. At the back of their minds, they knew what the Christ would do. And that's why the first line of resistance came from the Pharisees. Now, this is what the journey looks like when he, le he left the Judea and went back at once to the Galil. Verse 4, he says, Now he had to go through Samaria. You can even stop right there. Now he had to go through Samaria. Which means in this journey, it became an absolute necessity. It was necessary in the heart of Christ the Lord that he passes through Samaria. And I'll explain to you why it became a necessity. Hallelujah. He says, Now he had to go through Samaria. So when he came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. These are big events, and that's why I emphasize every now and then that the Bible is a word written by Jehovah Yahweh, Jehovah Elohim, our Father, our Creator. And because from where the wisdom of God begins, not even the highest level of the wisdom of man can reach. Just where the beginning of the wisdom of God is, our highest wisdom cannot even reach. And as far as heaven is from the earth, that is how different his ways are from our ways. Why do I say so? I'm saying so because if this word is the word of God written by the Lord through the Holy Spirit, then that means there is a lot of depth embedded in this word. And we cannot afford to read this word just like a novel. If you look at verse 4, all the way to verse 6, there's a lot embedded in there about the character of the church. He says, now he had to go through Samaria, which means it was a must, it was a necessity that he goes through Samaria. So when he came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, everything well chosen by the Lord. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's midday. That's noon, to translate it to you. Now, the first thing I want to mention to you here is the fact that the Lord is caused to leave Judea, but instead of passing in the normal route that the Jews followed, he is forced he is caused, he is compelled in his heart to pass through Sichar, Samaria. And if you read on, you see that that was totally unacceptable among the Jews. Hallelujah. And there at the same time, he finds the well of Jacob. And that's what we are going to focus on today, the church at the well of Jacob. Is today's church at the well of Jacob? Hallelujah. Listen to verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, 
Will you give me a drink? Now look at that. He is passed through Samaria. Jews are not allowed to pass through Samaria. They did everything to avoid, you know, to get to Jerusalem, to avoid Samaria. It was absolutely abominable to pass through Samaria. Hallelujah. But he is compelled. He says it is a necessity. Now he had to pass through Samaria, through the little town called Sichar. And there, what does he encounter? He encounters, hallelujah, Jacob's well. And later you begin to understand it is actually the church that he encountered there, the church of Christ that is at the well of Jacob. He encountered the church at the well. As in, what are you doing here? You are not supposed to be here. Hallelujah. So, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus has been resisted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Judea and is caused to immediately at once leave Judea and head for the Galil, the Kinneret in Israel, they call it Kinneret. But in this journey, he is forced, and the resistance he meets in Judea is because he's gaining and is baptizing, which speaks about the revival that was coming. But he is forced, I mean, he is compelled. The word forced may not even be the right word. He is compelled, he finds it an absolute necessity to pass through Samaria. Hallelujah. But now we are seeing that it was completely abominable for any Jew to even associate with Samaritans. When he passes through Samaria, he comes to a little town called Sichar, he meets the well of Jacob. At the exact plot that Jacob bought and gave to who? Gave to Joseph his son. And when he's seated there, tired, he is going to meet the church. Hallelujah. A woman appears there. And look at the engagement here. Look at the way he's engaging the woman. He's asking her to minister to him. To minister unto him. He said, give me a drink. And that was a deep prophecy. Give me a drink. She says, but how can you ask me? I am just a woman to begin with. If you look at the ranking of events, the Samaritans were considered lower than Jews. So Jews did everything from Judea to avoid Samaria to get to Jerusalem. They never crossed the land of Samaria. And so Samaritans were to begin with lower than Jews. Number two, to be a woman, a Samaritan woman was even lower. How can this Jewish man be asking her for a drink? Hallelujah. I am just building the foundation for this teaching. And you're going to be astonished. And so it's amazing to me. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Hallelujah. So he's already introducing the living water. Why is he introducing the living water? Remember many times in the Bible, the Lord Jesus was referred to as the living rock, the living stone. That's the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, 
you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ you see that that's one of the cases in which he was called the living stone and he was also called the living water that's what we are seeing here and that's what he's using to engage this woman to begin talking with this woman hallelujah and you'll be very astonished that actually this is the church that he encountered here he found the church at the well of Jacob as in asking what are you doing here if you knew he that asks you for a drink you would have asked him for living water I just want to take you a little bit back so you may understand this clearly the well of Jacob why was this called the well of Jacob let's go back to the book of Genesis somebody Genesis 33 verses 16 down to verse 19 he says so that the Esau started on his way back to Seir verse 17 Jacob however went to Sukkoth where he built a place for himself and made shelter for his livestock that is why the place is called Sukkoth verse 18 Genesis 33 after Jacob came from Padan Aram he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and he camped within the site of the city verse 19 for a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamor the father of Shechem the plot of ground where he pitched his tent there he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel so this is why that was called the well of Jacob because it is at this spot that he bought that property and he picked his tent and he dug his ground you can see very clearly he camped there at the site of at, within the, the site the view of the city with his livestock somebody Genesis 48 21 all the way 22 and now I read he says Naphtali is a dow set free that bears beautiful fawns Joseph listen to 22 now Joseph is a fruitful vine a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall hallelujah so listen to these precious people verse 22 Joseph is a fruitful vine a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall essentially what the Holy Spirit was saying here is that when Jacob finally had reached a time to divide the piece of property he divided it to his 12 sons he talked about Naphtali and then when it came to verse 22 of Genesis 48 he's talking about the piece of property plot that was divided for Joseph and so Joseph is a fruitful vine a fruitful vine near a spring that is the well we are talking about today hallelujah the well of Jacob in the plot he gave to Joseph his precious son and you see how he beautifully talks about it and now the Lord Jesus has been led out of necessity to come to this well hallelujah and to sit down at this well what a mighty 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 situation going here and so you see very clearly that the Jews were not allowed to go through the land of Samaria and Jesus has gone through this land one of the main things that stands out in this conversation the Lord he has come now to Jacob's well in the piece of property that belonged to Joseph a Samaritan woman appears and she now comes to the well 
The Lord is sitting there tired. Immediately the Lord begins to engage this woman. Give me a drink. And she says, no, you cannot ask me for a drink because you are a Jew. Right away you begin to understand that there was a sense of disqualification that was coming from this woman. She was disqualifying herself. She said, look, but I don't belong. It's not acceptable that you can speak with me, even ask me for help. That is totally unacceptable. That's unheard of. I am a Samaritan woman. Samaritan to begin with. And woman, even lower among the Samaritans. Let me open your eyes again today to another level. Now, the Bible speaks very clearly about the time when this was happening. In verse 6 it says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was, from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And then the Samaritan woman comes to draw water. You begin to understand right from the word go that people do not draw water from the well at the sixth hour. Nobody goes to the well to draw water at noon. Hallelujah. And yet this woman was coming to the well at noon. No wonder when she was talking to the Lord, she's telling the Lord, to begin with, I'm a Samaritan. You are not supposed to ask me for a drink of water. And the next thing about me is that I am a Samaritan woman. I don't even qualify to stand and sit and conversation with you. But now we are learning something else about this woman. That the Samaritan woman that we are talking about here is a woman that comes to the well at the sixth hour. In what I call the sixth hour person. She, she's a sixth hour woman. What is known, what is clear, and what is normal is that when people wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is go to the well and fetch the water while it is still clean. Hallelujah. The water in the morning is cool. And you know when water cools down because of the cold temperature at night, if you have been to Israel, I studied in Israel, and most of the places that are very hot, the desert-like places, in the day, they are very hot. The temperatures are very high. But the nights tend to be very cold, very cool. Hallelujah. And so, you find that water in the well is cold, is cooled by the night. And when water is cooled, the particles that may have made water not clean, they settle. They settle down. And that's why it makes a lot of sense that the majority of the women in Samaria, in that region, went to the well in the morning. And when they came to the well in the morning, they found when the water is not yet disturbed, the water is still cool, the water is clear, the volume of the well is also high, let me tell you somebody. When the well is being dug, when you're digging a well, you dig until you hit the water table. They call it the water table. And the water table, when you break the water table, even when you dig the borehole, that's how boreholes are being dug, you dig until you hit the water table. The water table is a hard pervious, they call it pervious, very hard piece of rock that covers the water underneath Underneath is what is called the ground water aquifers. Hallelujah. The ground water aquifer. So when one is digging a well, you have to dig until you hit the, the water table, the hard rock, and then break it and get to the groundwater aquifer. The groundwater aquifer is, 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 is the zone that contains very clean water under the earth here. And the rocks 
that are on the water table when you get close to the water those rocks are very rich in carbon let me help you somebody so you may understand the revelation the Lord is bringing to you they are rich in carbon and so when you hit the water table the water begins to surge up towards the well that you have dug but as they seep through it's called groundwater seepage as they seep through as the water seeps through as it seeps through it meets the carbon rocks but the surfaces of the carbon rocks are charged they are free radicals and so the free radicals they act as filters they purify the water as the water comes up as the water builds up in volume towards the surface of the well hallelujah and the charged particles that are present the charged surfaces the charged particles the radicals the free radicals present on the carbon rich rocks they bind the following three things look they bind the biological material in the water which means bacteria if there is bacteria in the water the charged surfaces of the bacteria are attracted bound by the free radicals so essentially the rocks act as biological filters that's why you see some of us most of us like me we grew up in the villages of africa our parents always went with pots and jerrycans on their heads with our mothers they went and they drew water from the well we drank that water and we never suffered from typhoid because the water is constantly being filtered by these carbon rich rocks that are free radicals binding bacteria the sub charged surfaces of the bacterial membranes so acting as biological filters the next thing they filter out is chemicals let's say if the water is very saline if there are some chemicals in the water the calcium they are bound by the rocks so the rocks still act as chemical filters the third one is hallelujah physical filters so the carbon rich rocks that are separating the surface towards the well and the groundwater aquifers that jacob had to break for that water to come up for the well to be known as jacob's well those rocks act as physical filters biological filters and chemical filters and that's why this well was called jacob's well and they drank from this well never fell sick so jesus has come to this well at the sixth hour a samaritan woman comes to fetch water and now you can see very clearly from what i've described to you on the process of making the well that it makes a lot of sense for women in samaria to be going to the well very early in the morning first thing provide clean pure and cool water for your family hallelujah because most of the water in the well is being fetched throughout the day for the animals for the livestock for the herds and for the people such that by evening the water level has gone down in the well and when the night comes and the well is resting the water seeps from the well, from the groundwater aquifers again to fill up the well so the process of fetching the water is even simpler in the morning the water is clearer the water is cooler and cleaner so what type of person is this woman that the lord had to pass through some area to encounter you can see that the lord was looking for this woman here what type of person was this woman that the lord encountered at the sixth hour hallelujah let me bring this to you today she must have been somebody that has suffered bitter rejection hallelujah she must have been somebody 
that has been rejected by the people of the little town that's called Sichia. And you know that when a town is small, as, as, as Sichia, then there is a psychology, a sociology of that town. People talk, people know each other, you know. In the town, they talk about each other. And for her to fail to come in the morning and to only come in the midday, that means she feared to come in the morning. Because in the morning there are women gossiping. There are stories going on. Maybe she did not want them to talk about her. Maybe she didn't have a good record, a good recommendation, something good to write home about. Maybe she was the subject of discussion in that little small town of Sichar. So she opted to go to the well when she would be alone. And look at what she says here. Verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank himself from it as did his sons and the flock and the herds? I'm introducing something very interesting here. The woman, the only way the Samaritan woman could come to the well at the sixth hour at midday is if this woman could not come in the morning. And the only way the Samaritan woman could fail to come in the morning is if there is something about her that was not right. She was being gossiped over. People were being proud, talking about their, their families, their husbands. Probably she had nothing good to talk about. If she has been rejected by the community, there is something she has done that is not well. So the women should be a subject of discussion at the well, in which case she would not want to be at the well in the morning. She did not come from a good ancestry, a good family background, something to talk about, you know. She had nothing to talk about. And we see very clearly here that it is definite she needed clean and clear cool water. Though she could not come there in the morning to fetch it. Who is this woman? I call her in this message, I call her the sixth hour woman. That means even as she came down to the well, she would not want to meet anybody there. She would stand at a distance, look around and see, is there anybody in the well? Nobody is in the well? Then let me go now and fetch water so I may not be humiliated. She's a humiliated person, that's what I can see here. And Jesus set out purposefully, set out deliberately, not to meet the women that fetch in the morning, but to meet this midday woman. Hallelujah. And don't lose track. The title of the message today is The Church at the Well of Jacob. The title is Serving the Lord in the Midst of Bitter Rejection. And we see very clearly that the Samaritan woman is in the middle of the, the harshest rejection, such that she can't even afford to come in the, in the morning. She has to come in the middle of the day, in the sixth hour. Hallelujah. And when you read on, Jesus is engaging her, but she says, the well is deep at this hour. Which means most of the water has been fetched already. Let me tell you one thing. When you come to the well in the morning, you will see the containers that the women are using to fetch water. And even the way the containers are lined up, you can just tell right away from the containers that are there who is at the well today. You can see the identity of the people at the well because those are the same containers they use on a daily basis to go for water. And when, let's say they woke up, like in some of the communities, before the sun begins in the Middle East, in Israel, in that area, the Mediterranean, 
They go to till the ground, the fields, as early as five o'clock before the sun rises, before the heat of the day comes. So at five they're in the field, they are digging, they prepare the fields for the wheat, the barley. Hallelujah. When the sun is beginning to rise, and it's coming to seven o'clock in the morning like this, the women leave the gardens, they leave the fields, they leave their homes towards the well. And I want to bring one other point to you here. They normally go in groups. Because such villages, such towns have a sociology. So they are walking, talking. Do you know what happened yesterday? Oh, so and so's wife was chased. He chased his wife. They fought yesterday at night. So and so's husband came back. So and so's daughter returned from her marriage. There is a sociology in the small villages in the Middle East. And so there is a lot of gossiping and talking and comparing of notes taking place in the morning. And that's why when you come to the well, you can pretty much tell the same types of containers. From the container, you can know who is at the well. Oh, Jane, wait for me as we go to the well. Are you already going? Wait for me. I'm going to pick my container. It was a club. And yet, this woman that Jesus set out to meet did not belong to that club. She did not belong to the morning club, the morning people. The morning people that fetched the cool water, the clean water, when the volume of, of the well is still high. Hallelujah. And I'm digging this very deep for you that today you may understand what it takes for you to enter the rapture of the church. And she's telling Jesus, how can you ask me for a drink when you don't even have a container to fetch water with? And the well is deep. At this hour, the water that seeped through the whole night has all been fetched. What is remaining is deep and turbid. Turbid, messed up. Because people have fetched for their cows. People have fetched for their homes. Everybody has already fetched. I want you to understand the person that Jesus set out on purpose out of a necessity in his heart to encounter. Hallelujah. A rejected person essentially. A humiliated person. A person that does not belong. Hallelujah. That is the one Jesus set out to meet. And he had to pass through Samaria because he had to meet this woman. But something is amazing to me here. When you read all the way back, he said, Hallelujah. Verse 8 His disciples had gone into town to buy food. So you see that when Jesus set out, he knew that he was going to meet this woman. Let me tell you one thing. Even me now, having been called by the Lord, normally every morning when I wake up, I have already known the type of people I'm going to meet. If as a servant of the Lord, I can be able to know the people I'm going to meet, how much more did Jesus know this woman before he set out? The Lord himself. Hallelujah. And he set out on purpose that he would have this time to go and encounter this woman. Not the women in the morning, but this woman here, the one that has been rejected, humiliated, being discussed, being gossiped about. This is the woman he set out to meet. The woman that hides before she comes to the well. Let me check. Is there somebody at the well? Okay, if there is nobody, now I can go because nobody will see me. She has accepted rejection. She's familiar with suffering somebody. Hallelujah. And she says, even if the water is turbid, I will go when everybody else is not there. Let me just suffer. Let me take the turbid water. Even if fetching is difficult, it's now deeper in the day because most people have harvested the water. I will just go and suffer to get that water. Do you begin to understand this, somebody? 
do you begin to see the person that Christ the Messiah set out to meet this woman in other words had similarity she was bearing an identity that is similar to Jesus are we there somebody familiar with suffering bitterly rejected somebody after all what what caused Jesus to set out from Judea towards the Galilee was the rejection he met from the Pharisees when they learned that he was baptizing he was gaining they rejected him it was a bitter warfare and we saw very clearly in John chapter 1 verse 24 that when they saw John the Baptist also baptizing and, and, and gaining they fought him a situation that caused John the Baptist to say you brutes of vipers who has opened your eyes who has given you wisdom to flee from the wrath of God and come here to be baptized and he says one thing that is important do not say to yourself that we are sons of Abraham we are children of Abraham for God out of these stones can raise for Abraham children but when you come here repent and produce the fruits of repentance hallelujah you see that conversation so Jesus also baptizing gaining he was resisted and on the way to the Galilee he said he had to pass through Samaria because he had to encounter this woman but I bring it to another level here for him to encounter this sixth hour woman who has suffered so much rejection hallelujah not the women in the morning that fetch cool water clean water the ones who belong to a club who are being who are talking good stories about their husbands about their homes about their children this one had no good story humiliated for him to encounter this woman he had to get rid of his disciples he sent them to buy food hallelujah so you see very clearly the type of person that the Lord is compelled that he finds as a necessity that when he's leaving from Judea to the Galilee he has to encounter and you see that he arrives there at the sixth hour and then the sixth hour woman appears the very woman that he had set out to meet and what else do you see here you see that this woman unlike the other women is compelled to come and fetch water at the sixth hour a very odd hour a very extra an hour that no strange no no woman goes to fetch water at that time all the other women who are living normal lives they fetch water in the morning when it's cool I just described through the process of groundwater seepage how there is the filtering of chemicals physical objects substances and biological bacteria and the water is cooler and cleaner and clearer in the morning and the volume is high hallelujah and yet this woman cannot afford to come in the morning because she has been slandered she is rejected she is humiliated she's facing bitter rejection she's familiar with suffering and sorrow she doesn't have anything good to present and so Jesus encounters this woman and in the process she says but this well belongs to Jacob our father verse 11 of John chapter 4 says sir the woman said you have nothing to draw and the well is deep where can you get this living water the Lord told her if you had known he that asks you for a drink you would have asked him for living water and that's why she says and you, where will you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and so did his sons and his flock and herds hallelujah essentially she was seeing a hint in the heart of this man she was talking to this man could be greater than Jacob 
Remember, at that time, it's all about name, even today. It is always about name. Jacob is a big name. You see that? When you talk Jacob, you are talking about big name. Established name. Even around that area. So if you are drinking from the well of Jacob, where Jacob himself drank, it speaks about status. It speaks about ancestry. Belonging somebody. And so, the Lord Jesus meeting a woman that is so rejected, so humiliated, she has nothing of her own to present or to ride home to. In other words, a person of suffering, of sorrows, familiar with suffering. But if you look at Jesus himself, he had just suffered rejection and his entire life was full of rejection. So you begin to see the similarity in the fact that this woman has been rejected and the Lord himself is rejected. So it explains to you very clearly why he set out to meet this church, this particular church. And at the well of Jacob today, I am going to speak to you about the two churches at the well of Jacob. The first church is this one here. The church that is familiar with suffering, that is serving the Lord under bitter rejection. Hallelujah. The church that has fallen in sin and needs the living water so much, needs repentance so much, needs redemption so much. The church that is humiliated, She's struggling. She knows she needs to be delivered by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And the church that is comfortable and drinking the cool, clean waters of the morning, the church that belongs, the church that has a good ancestry. Oh, Jacob is our father. Oh, he drank from it himself. And the Lord purposes to meet the church that is facing rejection at the well of Jacob. Isaiah 53. And see what he says there. About this church. Look at what he says. Verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Do you see what the Messiah was? Do you see what Christ Jesus was? Do you see why he set out purposefully? And the Bible says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Do you see why he had to pass through Samaria? So he would encounter this rejected Samaritan woman, this sixth hour person? I want you to know that the sixth hour our church of Christ is a rejected church. She is not enjoying in the world. She is not enjoying the sweets of the world, the sweet things of the world. The sixth hour church. She is humiliated in bitter rejection. She needs the Lord so much. And the Lord says, it's better than that one that needs to repent that needs my blood so she can be redeemed out of the rejection she's facing than the 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. Do you see the two churches there now? And the one he encounters, the one that is familiar with suffering like he is. Because the Bible says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. You see why Jesus set out to meet this woman? Rejected. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men should hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This is the character of the Messiah. And when you look at John chapter 4, you see the same character in this woman. The church 
at the sixth hour. He says, the well is Jacob's well, you know. He, he says, the sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? And so did his sons. That was the blood for Joseph and his flock and herds. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Hallelujah. Look at the mighty, mighty, mighty statement the Lord gives this woman. He says, whoever drinks out of this well will become thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the living water that I'm talking about will never thirst into eternity. You begin to understand right away that the Lord was speaking about the two churches that were drinking from the well of Jacob. There is one church that is drinking in the morning. That church represents the righteous people. Everything is working out well for them in the world. They are drinking from the cool waters of the morning. They are coming together. They are not lonely. They are not humiliated. They are not isolated. They are in a group. They come in a company. Every woman is having her, her vessel on her head. They are coming to the well in the morning. Wait for me, Jane. Mary, wait for me as you go to the well. They come in a group. I said, when you come to the well, and you look at the vessels in the well that have been filled with water, you can almost automatically right away tell who is at the well. Because you can see their identity there. They belong. They are so comfortable because in the morning they fetch clean, cool water for their families. They come in a group. They are part of a social club. They are able to compare notes. What happened yesterday? They also gossip and talk about, they talk about what is going on even in the town of Sichar. That is the normal church, the righteous church that comes to the well that has been accepted by the world, the church that is enjoying the good things of the world. She's comfortable. But the Lord chooses to come to encounter and meet the sixth hour church, the lonely church, the isolated church, the bitterly rejected church, the church that does not have a good ancestry. Do you relate to this as a servant of the Lord? Have you found that sometimes you are rejected, you are almost standing alone with the church that you are preaching, the church you are pastoring, you are almost walking alone with your family, Many times you are humiliated. And Jesus says, in John chapter 4, verse 13, that everyone who drinks from this water will thirst again, which means we'll always come back here. That means the morning people that drink from the best of this water will always thirst and come back to fetch again. But whoever encounters their hour of visitation, like this precious woman that is so much isolated, rejected and humiliated, she cannot even come with a friend to the well, that whoever comes and fails to drink the best of this water and encounters their hour of visitation, 
and drinks from the living water that I will give them will never thirst again forever and ever. Hallelujah. So you see very clearly that the Lord was already engaging her on the living water. On the fact that she need not be comfortable with the earthly water. The water that came from the well of Jacob. In other words, the Lord was telling her, get out of the well of Jacob so you may encounter the living water. Let's see how that advances. Verse 15, he says, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Why did this woman tell the Lord to give her the living water that she may not keep coming back here to draw the earthly water from Jacob's well? Because she had suffered a lot of rejection. And she was humiliated. She was tired of coming to the well by hiding and coming. But before I go forth forward on how this conversation advances, and even to the ultimate revival the Lord is speaking to the church, I want to look at the other sixth hour persons that are cited in the Bible that the Lord Jesus has so much used mightily for his glory, even to speak to the church. In the book of Mark chapter 5, I'm reading verses 24 on, <clears throat> a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, you see the moment of encounter there? She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought to herself, if I just touch the hem of his cloth, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she had been freed from suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone from him, and he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? You see they are crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done this. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came up and fell at his feet, and trembling, with tears, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from suffering. Listen to me, precious people. What the Lord is saying is this. He's saying that if you are the church that is comfortable in the world, and you are enjoying the good things of the world, there is no way you can encounter your hour of visitation. And so you cannot even enter into the rapture of the church. Because only the Holy Spirit that cometh from the hour of the visitation of the Lord can prepare the church even to enter the rapture of the church. The other thing the Lord is saying, only the sixth hour church, only the sixth hour persons who have faced bitter rejection like the Samaritan woman, who have been humiliated, 
who have hit rock bottom only those that have hit rock bottom can encounter their hour of visitation and so when the Lord was speaking here he was speaking about the need for the church at the well of Jacob to be at the sixth hour you cannot go to the well of Jacob in the morning you have to go at the sixth hour because that is when you will encounter the Lord and those that come at the well at the sixth hour are the ones who have hit rock bottom we see that Samaritan woman had hit rock bottom she was being ashamed, humiliated, talked about, laughed at, gossiped over. Now, the other person I want to talk about here is the woman with the issue of blood. This is yet another sixth hour person. This is yet another sixth hour church. And you see that for the Samaritan woman, the Lord knowing how critical his disciples would be, or how critical they are he had to get rid of them to send them to buy food in town so he could have time to encounter this woman the same thing is happening in Mark chapter 5 the Lord is getting rid of his disciples so he can encounter the woman with the issue of blood he's telling them who has touched me and they say but Lord there are many people pressing around you how can you ask that he gets rid of them he ignores them and continues to ask who has touched me and then the woman comes forth and he says daughter you have been healed remember in the Greek healing means saved you have been saved hallelujah and he speaks very clearly and your sins have been taken away.
what's your name? My name is Jen Kiptanoi Tarus. Jen Kiptanoi Tarus. Mm. Can you speak to us? I remember when the Lord sent me to Nandi Hills. Mm. You were completely mad, insane. What can you remember? Nakumbuka. I remember I was a completely mad woman, crazy woman. I removed my clothes. I ran. But I want to ask you, Nataka mm. Nikulize, Shida Ilianza Lini, Ulukwanayo Kwa Miakangapi. For seven years, she was a lunatic, running out, walking naked, and all this happening, destructive and violent. Na ulikuwa, yumekuwa meka saba, ulikuwa unajihisi vipi wakati huo? Mi nafungwa na mneni kamba. She was being tied with ropes. Ulikuwa nafungwa na kamba. Na kufungwa na miti, nesikimbie. She was being tied with ropes at a tree. Asa wasasi wanamesema, nini mkwenjwa hii ya mtote yetu? And the parents asked, what kind of sickness is this? Wanaenda kwa wakanga. They went to which doctors? Wanaenda kwa wataktari wa nyumbani nyumbani. They went to doctors of the village. Wanaenda kwa daktari ya hospitali. They went to medical doctors in the hospitals. And yet sickness has continued. That lunacy continued with her at that time. Sasa wabeneambia udungiwe medicate kila siku. And they said she should be injected with that medication every day. Sasa... The Lord has healed her, so she is not being injured. Me, precious people, this woman with the issue of blood is also a sixth hour person. And that is the only way the Lord could encounter her. Because you can imagine in that setting, the most humiliating thing for a woman is to bleed when she is bleeding. Even the book of Moses had mentioned very clearly that when someone is bleeding, they are supposed to be outcast, outcast, kept out. She was bleeding for 12 years, rejected, she suffered. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. She lost a lot of blood. She had no strength. She was gossiped over. She had no confidence. You can imagine a woman bleeding for 12 years. And you know how difficult it is. Blood is even a medium of bacterial growth. So she was not even... She didn't have self-esteem. She feared to go where there are people. No wonder she was always alone like the Samaritan woman. Let me even bring you further to another level. What the law of Moses said about such a woman, why she felt humiliated, what makes the woman of the issue of blood a sixth hour person. I'm using the book of Leviticus chapter 15 to emphasize to you what the woman of the issue of blood felt like. To emphasize to you that this woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5, she had hit rock bottom. You can imagine how humiliating it is for a woman to be bleeding on a daily basis for 12 years. You can imagine how rejected she was because she's bleeding, she's not smelling well. All these things are happening to her. But let's bring it to another level so you may understand what the Lord is talking about. The book of Leviticus chapter 15 verse 25 when this is now the law of Moses what the law prescribes, prescribes. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period or has a discharge that continues beyond her period she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge. And just as in the days of her period, she will be unclean. You can begin to imagine. The Bible says that if a woman begins to discharge blood in other days when she is not in a monthly period, 
she becomes unclean. That's what the law of Moses looked at this woman as. And said she will be unclean just as she is always when she is in her period. So you can imagine 12 years of being unclean, what this woman went through. Being humiliated. It is tremendous. And then it continues on. It says, Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean. What a tremendous time. What a tremendous statement, somebody. You see? As in her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean as during her period. Whoever touches them will be unclean. That means she was separated, an outcast, cut off. Anything she touched, you could not even touch. Any chair she sat on, you could not even sit on. That's how serious this is. Hallelujah. That is the rock bottom this woman hit that qualifies her to be a sixth hour person like the rejected Samaritan woman. And I said, Jesus has purposed specifically to encounter the sixth hour church. That is the church that sees the visitation of the Holy Spirit. Not the church that is accepted in the world, has compromised the world, is enjoying the goodness, the good things flowing out of the world. Compromised with sin. But the sixth church, rock bottom. Do you understand what this means to this woman? 12 years. Anything she touches, nobody can touch. Any chair she sits on, nobody can sit on. Any bed she lies on, anything she gains contact with is declared unclean by the law of Moses. And the law of Moses was given by God. Hallelujah. Whoever touches them will be unclean. He must wash his clothes and bathe with water. He will be unclean until evening. When she's cleansed from her discharge, she must count off seven days, and after that she will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, she may take two, de two doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The priest is to sacrifice them for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. In the same way, he will make atonement for her before the Lord for the uncleanness of her discharge. You must keep the Israelites separated from the things that make them unclean, so they will not die in their uncleanness, hallelujah, for d defiling any dwelling that is my dwelling, which is among them. These are the regulations for a man with a discharge, also the same. So viewers, you see very, very clearly that this woman with the issue of blood suffered tremendously because the law of Moses was very clear that any woman that was discharging or bleeding, she would be considered unclean as if she were having her monthly period. And so, in the same context, you can now begin to imagine the gravity of her rejection for 12 years. And that's why I make it very clear here that this is another woman that had suffered bitter rejection and that Jesus purposed to meet. Another case of or someone who is rejected, the twelfth hour person rejected. The book of John chapter 8, beginning verse 1. But when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, at dawn he appeared again at the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this as a question to trap him in order that they could have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, 
If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, to stoop down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who had begun to go away one by one, the older ones first, until Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked a woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and live your life of sin. This is very important, precious viewers. You see that the woman that was caught in adultery was another woman that had hit rock bottom. She had been caught, she had been arrested by these Pharisees and the teachers of law. And then they, were, they brought her to Jesus. They were to stone her. But at that time, Jesus asked them, Is there any one of you that has not sinned? And if there is any, please pick a stone and be the first to throw at her. And then they walked away. But Jesus did not condone the sin, the sin of adultery. All he asked her is go and stop the life you are living full of sin. So it's very clear here that the Samaritan woman was a sinful woman. And so she was a sixth hour woman, a rejected woman. It's also clear that the woman with the issue of blood was also considered unclean according to the law of Moses. She had suffered 12 years considered unclean. Anything she touched was considered unholy. Anything she touched was considered unclean, defiled. Now here in John chapter 8, we also see the woman caught in adultery, actually unclean. She has been caught in the act of adultery, the act of sexual sin. These are women that had hit rock bottom. They essentially represent the sinful church that needs Christ. They represent the church that has hit the rock bottom, and the only way out is the redemptive power of Christ Jesus. Because I want to share with you yet another case of the sixth hour church. We have seen clearly that the Samaritan woman was isolated, rejected, humiliated, and yet Jesus set out purposefully to meet her, on purpose. We have also seen the woman with the issue of blood. According to the law of Moses, anytime anyone was discharging blood, she was discharging blood for 12 years, like that. She was considered unclean by the law. And anything she touched, nobody touched. Even the chair she sat on, nobody could sit on. In the other case in time, we have seen is the woman who committed adultery. Now she suffered a lot of rejection and she was to be stoned because she had sinned. These are all cases of the church that needs Christ, the church that has sinned. And now I want to look at one other case of the church that needs the blood of Jesus, the church that Jesus purposed to encounter and so she may be redeemed. The book of Luke chapter 7 and beginning from verse 36 it says, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and as she stood behind him at his feet, wiping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had been invited saw this, they said to him, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. You see, they were saying very clearly that if he was a prophet, he would have known that this woman touching his feet were a sinner. That's very critical because the Pharisees were critical of Jesus and his practices, even the fact that he's gaining, he's gaining ground, he's gaining more people and baptizing. I jump now to verse 44. He says, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You do not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You do not give me a kiss, but this woman, 
from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but this woman poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, uh -huh, but he who has been forgiven later loves later. Now listen, precious people, this is very, very important. You see that the woman who brought the perfume and broke the alabaster and perfumed Jesus' feet was a sinful woman. And so that's why at the end, the healing that takes place here is Jesus forgives her sins. The same thing with the Samaritan woman. How about now the lost son? Look back at the lost son. The lost son also in the book of Luke, he went out, he had nothing until he hit rock bottom completely. He was ridiculed, he was isolated and rejected. He took his, the, the wealth the father gave him, he squandered the wealth out there in wild living. And the Bible says when he came back, his elder brother fought him. So all these are cases of the church that needs the blood of Jesus for redemption. And we see very clearly that only this type of church enters the kingdom of God. Only this type of church is forgiven by the Lord. So it's very, very important today that we understand what happens at the well of Jacob. At the well of Jacob, the church that is isolated, that serves Jesus in bitterness, the church that recognizes her sin, her sinfulness, is the church that is delivered by the Lord, the Samaritan woman, you see. And the Lord Jesus continued to speak with her. Now look at verse 16. He told her, go call your husband. When she realized that this man was talking of an eternal water, a living water, that she would have to drink and she would never ever get thirsty again, the first thing that dawned on her was her own situation. She said, then please, why don't you give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back here? You see that? It means she was tired of being humiliated, of escaping and hiding to come to the well at the sixth hour. But Jesus says, now go call your husband. In other words, Jesus was already opening her sins to her to bring her to conviction so she could repent. Now look at that. As they continue, you go call your husband, the Lord said. And then, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five men, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you say, what you have just said is quite true. The woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. You see, very, very clearly. This woman was able to identify Jesus rightfully. Now, the church in the morning, the church that was coming to drink the cool, clean water, the church that is righteous and has a good ancestry, that church does not encounter the Lord. Neither does the Lord set out to meet that church. That is the church you see today in the world. The church of Christ today is a church comfortable in sin, the church is comfortable with the things of the world. They eat well, they drive well, they live in the ways, in the manner, and the style of the world. They dress like the world. They preach a gospel that suits the world. So they are very comfortable. That's the morning church that is fetching cool water. But the church that sets out today to serve the Lord in holiness and righteousness will be persecuted. And that's, that's represented by this Samaritan woman, by the lost son who took his wealth, the father divided for him and squandered in wild living, by the woman caught in adultery, by the woman with the issue of blood. That is the church that hits rock bottom and sees the necessity of Christ. So it's very, very important to understand that when you look up back at the ancestry, this woman at the well, she talks of the well belonging to who? To Jacob. You see that way back in John chapter 3, when John the Baptist was speaking to the Pharisees, he was saying, do not say to yourself that Abraham is your father. Because for them at that time, ancestry was a very, very big thing. 
The same thing you see here with the well of Jacob. Those who are harvesting the good water of the well of Jacob, for them ancestry is very critical. And that is what you see also with the church that appreciates redemption from the blood of Jesus. The Gentile church, for example. Now look, Jesus came from the, the, the Hebrew church. He came from the Jewish community. But the Gentile church was left far behind. Now there was a Levitical priesthood and then the new priesthood the Lord brought forth. In the book of Hebrews, I'm reading chapter 7, you also see this church Jesus is talking about here. Hebrews chapter 7, and this is what he says here. And he says, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings, and he blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means the king of righteousness. Then also, the king of Salem means the king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, or without beginning of days or end of life, he is like the son of God, and he remains a priest forever. Just think of this, how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, the law requires that the descendants of Levi became priests to collect a tenth from the people. That is, that the brothers, hallelujah, even though the brothers were descendants from Abraham. Now, listen to this. Verse 6. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham, and he blessed him as he had promised, you know. And without a doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In one case, one-tenth collected by man who died. Now, that's very clear here. It's very, very clear here that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. So there is no way the, the Jews, the Hebrews were saying, but Abraham is our father. Because Melchizedek, Jesus appeared as Melchizedek. And he had no genealogy, no records. The Lord kept talking about Levi when he was speaking with Moses about the priesthood. And Levi was the priesthood. Levi was the priesthood. So the Gentile church was out. There was nobody else who could be called into the priesthood until the change of covenant. Now look at this, the change of covenant. You see? If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and for on the basis of it, the law was given to people. Why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there must also be a change in the law. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served in the altar. For it is clear that our Lord Jesus descended from Judah. In regard to this tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And down they said, you are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, it is very important to understand this, precious uh, viewers, that uh, in the same context, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, you see the Samaritan woman had been rejected. Her genealogy was not well set straight. And so she was drinking from the well of Abraham, but she was isolated. She was in pain. She was in bitter rejection. And no wonder she came at midday. And that's why I call her the sixth hour person. And when she comes, she comes to the well, she's able to encounter the Lord Jesus. She encounters her hour of visitation. You see that? And yet, the church that is comfortable with the world, living well, eating well, compromised with the world, like you see in today's churches, does not encounter her hour of visitation. That's the message the Lord is saying here. You have to be a church that has been afflicted, that has suffered rejection, that is familiar with suffering. Because Jesus himself, in Isaiah 53, he is a man of sorrows, rejected by all men, the living stone rejected by all men. He is familiar with suffering. You have to wear the identity of Christ, the identity marker of the suffering of Christ for you to appreciate how what Christ went through for you even to meet your moment of visitation you have essentially to be a sixth hour church the church that fetches water at the well of Abraham at noon in the sixth hour when the water is not clean in other words you have to be someone who is suffering in this world 
in pain, not comfortable in this world for you to meet your hour of visitation. Just like the Samaritan woman at the sixth hour meets her hour of visitation. Now look at the second level. They were talking of the well of Abraham. Big name, Abraham. The, the well of Jacob. Big name, Jacob. The children of Abraham. Big name, Abraham. But look at this. Now, when the Lord brings Jesus, familiar with suffering, no genealogy. You see, he says, no father, no mother, when Melchizedek appears. That is Jesus. No genealogy, no records. And his tribe is not the popular Levite. He's not a Levi tribe that was ordained to be the priesthood. You see what I'm saying? Now we're touching the priesthood this time. And yet, out of the tribe of Judah, now he calls the priesthood, essentially speaking about the grafting of the Gentile church into the covenant the Lord had with Abraham. Do you get this, somebody? So it's very, very important that we understand that the Samaritan woman essentially speaks of the church that enters the rapture, the revival church. But look down there what, the, what he says. In verse 19, he says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers that the Father seeks. God is a spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit. Let me just stop there. You see very clearly that the kind of worship that was going on in, at the well of Jacob were two types of worship. There was a group that was worshipping in the morning, worshipping at the well of Jacob, but only those that worshipped at midday, like the Samaritan woman, were able to encounter the living water and go into the true worship. Because now Jesus, having realized that the woman has identified him as a prophet, now he sets out and he tells her, look, a time is coming when true worship will take place, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, and worshiping in the spirit. And so the Lord had seen her heart, that because she has been able to identify him right, then this is going to be a true worshiper. And that's why he says, these are the ones the Father seeks. So you look at this woman, the sixth hour woman, the rejected woman, the demonized woman, dehumanized in the village, coming at midday for water, when nobody's likely to come and fetch water at that time, fetching the turbid water and clean water is what she drank, uncomfortable in this world, full of her sins, this is the woman that Jesus set out to meet so she could encounter the living water. And when he encounters her, she's able to identify him and is able to speak the true living water into her and speak to her worship in the spirit and in the truth. And it's amazing to me, precious people, that the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. So she's already eye-opened. Her spiritual eyes have been opened. Only those that come at the sixth hour at the well of Jacob will have their eyes opened. If you're coming in the comfortable hour, look at where the Church of Christ is sitting today. She's busy worshipping at the well of Jacob in the morning when the water is cool. She sees no tribulation, no isolation, no sorrow, no suffering. So she's very comfortable in that sin and she sees no need for the Messiah to come. But only the church that worships at rock bottom, worships at the sixth hour, needs the blood of Jesus and finds her hour of visitation. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman, but no one asked, what do you want? Or what are you doing talking with this with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come to see a man who had told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? This woman now is able 
to leave her jar of water, her most precious commodity, the water she was fetching. The others jealously guard it. They fetch it when it's very clean in the morning. They put a lot of value to it and they take it to feed their families with clean water, to bring clean water to their families. But this one comes in at midday when the water is turbid. It is difficult to fetch. Nobody's at the well. The water is not even clean. And the most precious thing which the morning people guard so much, she's able now to live at that well. She didn't carry it. The Bible says very clear here. You see, then leaving her jar of water, verse 28, then leaving her jar of water, the woman went back to the town and said, the people come see and was told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? You see that? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. While his disciples eyed him, Rabbi, eat something. But he told them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples say to each other, could someone have brought food for him? All, all that is happening down here. My food, he said, Jesus said, is to do the will of the one who sent me. So you see very clearly that when this woman encounters Christ, when she realizes that this is the Christ, that this man is a prophet, she is able to give the right identification on him. And here in verse 28, then leaving her jar of water, the woman went back to the town and said, the people come see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And she ran to town to call the people. What does this represent? This represents the church that does not attach so much value to the earthly things, the things of the world. Because you see that the precious commodity which the morning people, the other church that is worshipping at the well of Jacob, they harvest clean water, cool water, they treasure water, they pride themselves of the things of the world, the water, which represents the things of the world. That physical water at the well of Jacob represents the physical world. And they are busy worshipping at that well, at that mountain. And yet, the sixth hour worshipper, who is rejected, isolated, and non-conformist, she is the one who is now able to encounter Jesus, and then she leaves the very commodity she came to bring, to come to fetch, and she runs, after leaving the very commodity water, which she went to fetch, she runs to town to tell them about Christ. What does that mean to the church? Now, in the book of First John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, this is what he says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For, the, for everything in the world, the craving of sinful man, and the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world with its sinful desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. You see very clearly that this woman fits this scripture here, because she ceases to love the world, after encountering Christ. And so that tells you very clearly that at the well of Jacob, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, he essentially had set out to go to meet his bride, to meet the church that enters the rapture. There were two churches at that place, the righteous people that come in the morning to fetch the water when it's clean and cool and disturbed, they are all well, they are in a good setup with the world. And that is the church you see today in the world. The Church of Christ today has compromised with the world. She's very comfortable with the world. Politicians come in the church, they preach from the pulpit. The church has lies going on, dressing of immoralities in the church. Many of these things have made the church comfortable in the world, not to be rejected by the world. But look at the Samaritan woman. She is demonized because of her sins. She has no husband of her own to be proud about in the morning session when people are fetching water. So she's forced to come at the sixth hour at midday at noon. She's rejected, demonized. She's isolated. She's familiar with suffering, a woman of sorrows, which is the very image, the very mirror image and the character that Christ has. No wonder Christ sets out to meet her but when he meets her, 
she even leaves the very water that people treasure she leaves it there to come to meet Christ and to go to speak to the people in town and what do you see a big revival ensues in town and eventually what the Bible says is verse 39 many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony he told me everything I ever did so many people in Samaria received Christ and so when the Samaritans came to him they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days now look at that that is the same thing that you see in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 he says here I am I stand at the door and knock and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I'll come in and eat with him and he with me so this is what happened in Samaria because this woman having recognized Christ she abandoned her water which she had treasured so much the things of the world water here represents the things of the world she abandoned thereby fulfilling first john chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 do not love the things of the world if anyone loves the things of the world the love of the father is not in him the craving of the things of the world pass away so this woman is able to leave the things of the world having encountered the living water she is already quenched her thirst eternally and she runs to town and she brings the people of Samaria and the Samaritans believe her and then they meet Christ and they believe him and then they are now able to allow him to enter Samaria and dwell with them for those two days that represents the church that opens the door and Christ is able to enter but remember one thing the church in the morning those who are fetching water in the morning the church that is worshiping at the well of Abraham in the morning is comfortable in the world has clean water they treasure it so much they can't allow to leave it there and go tell somebody about Jesus that is the church that you see today in the world the church that we have today on the four corners of the earth they are so comfortable in the world people roll in in big cars pastors collect big money take to the banks on Monday that church first of all cannot encounter her moment of visitation that church cannot encounter Christ that church cannot leave the water that church loves the things of the world that church is closed cannot open her door for Jesus to enter and dwell with her eat with her only the church that has faced bitter rejection so much suffering like the Samaritan woman who knows what it means to be rejected in sorrow in suffering in isolation to be demonized cannot even afford to be in the morning session that is the church that encounters her hour of visitation encounters Jesus look at this from that moment on that church opens our door and then Jesus is able to come in and many Samaritans receive the Lord and essentially the end time revival hits her and she enters into the rapture of the church so may the Lord bless you and help you that you may even embrace rejection and bitter pain isolation and suffering for the sake of Christ because in that sixth hour of suffering in that sixth hour of worship there is going to be true worship the worship in spirit and in truth in that sixth hour there is going to be your visitation in that sixth hour the gates of heaven are open that you may enter into the kingdom of God Shalom the